Behind the big lie was an even bigger lie. It is the lie that this increasingly diverse American electorate does not get to determine the future of the country. The lie and the logic of January 6th is a sickness. It is a kind of cancer that then metastasized into dozens of voter suppression laws all across our country. And we must be vigilant tonight because these anti-democratic forces are at work right now in Georgia and all across our country. Yes, I, I saw him. I saw him holding the Bible. and endorsing a Bible as if it needed his endorsement. He should try reading it. It says, do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with your God. He should try reading it. It says, love your neighbor as yourself. It says, inasmuch as you've done it unto the least of these, you have done it also unto me. I choose the American covenant. E pluribus unum, out of many one. I choose January 5th. I choose a nation that provides a path for ordinary people and gives every child a chance. And that's Joe Biden's America. And he's been fighting for it for more than a half century. President Biden, America is so much better because of you, a true patriot who has always put the people first. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Joe. But I'll tell you something else. Not only is that Joe Biden's America, that's Kamala Harris's America. Senator yeah. Raphael Warnock of Georgia speaking last night you, at the DNC. He's speaking so last night. Good. You know, the thing is, Willie, it's all about, like, who you follow and okay, who stop. follows you, right? Stop. So if you're Herman's Hermits, Joe. you don't want to follow the Beatles, right? You just don't want to do it. Okay. And if you're Chris Coons, you don't want to follow. I love Chris Coons. The pastor. But Pastor Chris had to amazing. follow, had to just follow his, just his Minister spot, Warnock. His spot in the batting order, Senator Coons, after uh, Senator Warnock, Reverend Warnock, took us to Ebenezer Baptist Church for a few minutes last night. Yeah. Sure. Okay. And the Reverend joins us now from Chicago. Reverend Preach, baby, preach. <laughs> that uh, was really great. Wonderful message last night. We, you know, we've been talking, we've been talking, uh, and, and you touched on this last night, but we've been talking about how strange it is that Republicans have turned on America. That Donald Trump says that we're a lousy nation, we're a failing nation, we're a nation of losers, we're a stupid nation. And you actually have the Democrats stepping in the gap, holding up USA signs, telling their own stories like you told your own story about the greatness of America and weirdly enough, that's a story that the Republican nominee just doesn't get because he trashes America every day. That's absolutely right, Joe. And it's great to be here with you and Mika. Great to be here with with Jonathan. Um, uh, listen, I, I love this country. And here's why we are, are fighting so hard this this cycle. The great thing about America is we always have a path to make it better. And uh, whatever it is we need to correct, at least we, we have the instrumentation. We have a tradition, a democratic mm -hmm. tradition. Uh, and I'm a product of that. Uh, born literally a year after Dr. King's death, my life is so incredibly different uh, because of the sacrifice of him and so many others. And, and here I am, a kid who grew up in public housing, 
uh, from a very large family, first college graduate in my family. I'm a United States senator, and, and every morning for all the challenges in Washington, every now and then I have to pinch myself. I can't believe mm. I get to stand up on behalf of poor children all across America, from Atlanta to Appalachia. And uh, that's the message that I tried to bring last night. We've got to heal the land. Senator, good morning. It's great to see you. For those of our viewers who may not have had a chance to see your speech yet uh, from last night, you spoke about a January 5th America right. versus a January 6th America. Could you explain what you meant by that? Well, I was elected uh, to the Senate alongside my brother uh, and dear friend John Ossoff. Uh, here you have an, an African-American man who grew up in public housing, uh, the pastor of Ebenezer Baptist Church, where Martin Luther King served, alongside a Jewish man, the son of an immigrant, elected from a state that was in the old Confederacy uh, in one fell swoop on January 5th. And, you know, there I was celebrating. In fact, the next morning I was on this show, and we were all talking about what a great victory. Uh, but it was short-lived, uh, the, the celebration. Later that day, we saw the other side of the complicated American story. And this is, this is what I try to be honest about in my work. There are those who would say, well, January 6th, that's not who we are as a country. Well, there, there is a way in which that's who we've always been. The good news is that's not all that we are. The, the complicated American story is what I was trying to talk about. This January 5th, January 6th, a short 24-hour period, mm -hmm. both speaking a truth about our country and before us in this very election, uh, we get to choose, as every generation of Americans, which direction we'll go. So, Senator, I want to go back to, I know it was a meaningful moment for you last night. We just played it there, talking about the Bible. Um, and you referred to Donald Trump not only holding it for a photo op after he used law enforcement to clear a park of peaceful protesters, sure. but also now trying to sell it and autograph it. Um, and you didn't use the word weird, which I think is now a word that's being overused in Democratic talking points. But it just, it, to me, it struck it struck me as showing just how out of step he is, out of touch he is for the values that so many Americans have, and that that should be a big part of this campaign going forward, sort of reinforcing that idea, hey, he's in it for himself. He's not like us. Absolutely. And, you know, as a pastor, as a person of faith, I take great offense with the way in which he is weaponizing uh, the symbols of our great country and also the symbols of the faith towards this kind of hate. And we've seen this kind of thing historically. And um, listen, uh, we're the United States of America. I think there are enough decent people. Uh, we will push past this, this awful chapter of hate and division and Trumpism. Um, but I, I, I have to say that the, the Christian church is going to have to come to terms with the fact that there is no full accounting for this phenomenon of Trumpism without reference to the church. And we, we've got to come to terms with that. Uh, my faith is not a weapon, it's a bridge. And that's the way Dr. King used his faith. That's the way Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel used his faith, who said when he marched alongside <clears throat> Dr. King, he felt like his legs were praying. And, and I was trying to call us back to that moral tradition uh, that evinces certain values that I think are resonant in all of the great faith traditions. And you know, um... That's, that's how so many pastors, uh, ministers, reverends use the faith as a bridge. Uh, and, and Senator, I, I remember when Billy Graham decided to go to the Soviet Union and he, he caught so much flack from a lot of people, a lot of conservatives, a lot of his followers. Why would you go to the Soviet Union? And he said, because I need to spread God's message there as well. And Billy Graham always saw his faith, as you said, as a bridge, not a weapon. Uh, and, and you're right about that reckoning. When does that begin? Well, it's work that I think is happening now. And, and even as I talk to some young evangelicals uh, in Georgia, um, folks who grew up in the church, uh, they're becoming deeply disaffected by the ways in which, um, um, you know, the churches uh, or certain certain parts of our churches uh, have allowed themselves to be used in this way. And um, I, I, which is why I think it's important, particularly for those of us in the Democratic Party, um, uh, to be full throated in the ways in which our faith uh, informs our values. 
we've got to be full-throated in resisting this idea of Christian nationalism. And uh, we've got to embrace, I think, the kind of faith that, that caused Martin Luther King Jr. and so many others to stand for the best uh, in our tradition. For me, democracy. Democracy is the political enactment of a spiritual idea, this notion that each of us has within us a spark of the divine, that we were created in what the theologians call the imago Dei, the image of God. And if, if I have a spark of the divine, I ought to have a voice in the direction of the country and uh, my destiny within it. And I ought to respect the humanity of, of all of God's people, those of other faith traditions, those who claim no faith at all. Uh, that is this grand American experiment and um, we get to write the next chapter. Democratic Senator Raphael Warnock of Georgia, thank you very much for being on the show this morning. Good morning. Thanks. All right, we appreciate it. And coming. I was in the hall in 04, uh, and of course, Barack Obama, there was buzz in Democratic circles, uh, but not every delegate uh, knew necessarily what course he would be on. Not every person in that hall until he took the stage. Um, and he gave a speech that I think more so than certainly most speeches outside of maybe inaugurals that, that us nerds focus on, a speech that is remembered not only for its energy, which it had, um, but for its substance, um, that he drew on his tradition, his family background, a story of diversity, a story, by the way, also of migration um, and America's tradition in its best sense of welcoming immigrants who then become, of course, full American families that go on to lead our country, not putting that in some asterisk or side capsule. And he drew on all that while also being inclusive in ways that you and I and others were discussing last night that the Harris campaign has set that tone. Uh, and he did that those lines that people remember, that we worship an awesome God in the blue states, uh, that we don't like federal intrusions in our libraries in the red states, uh, and so forth. I, I don't think it's an overestimation, Joy, to tell you that it took off, it lit up the room, but also mattered in ways that years later, people, if they're not quoting the exact lines, they remember the substance, the spirit of that speech. So uh, that's what I remember. I'm curious what you're seeing already today from your reporting uh, as we go into this big night that does turn the page from Biden, literally. Yeah, absolutely. And I, just to comment on that, because that was the time when I had gotten out of the news business and was in the campaign world uh, working for, and, and as a matter of fact, I had taken the Wellstone Action Network training that uh, Governor Walls took, too, when he decided to run for, uh, for office after being a high school teacher. And, you know, I just remember 04 being the smartest decision that John Kerry ever made, in a sense, the worst decision, because he was so overshadowed in 2004 mm. by this man who seemed to come out of nowhere nowhere for a lot of people. And that was the speech after which um, Oprah Winfrey declared Barack Obama to be the one. Remember that? He, she, he was the one. And I think people started anticipating that he would eventually run for president. And whatever doubts people had that that black man who was named Barack Hussein Obama could be president, I think they were erased in that night. Mm. I am also looking to this speech because we all understand and have come to understand that Barack Obama is one of the great orators of our time. He truly is one of the most gifted speech makers in the Democratic Party, but also in the country. And it was his gift, his, his ability to explain America to itself, to look at America both in the mirror and also to look at it through the window, right? So that he can see America in himself, but he can also see us in a sense the way the world sees us, because he has a, a background that has placed him in the world outside of his country. And so he sees us in a way that sometimes we don't even recognize, and he's able to articulate that in such a profound way that I always look forward to listening to a, an Obama speech. But I also have heard Michelle Obama speak. And when I was back in the whole journalism world, traveled with her when she was doing a tour to talk about all of the things she was doing to help our children eat better. And on that tour, she gave speeches that would literally light your hair on fire. She is underrated yeah. as an incredible speaker who is profound. So I think I and everyone in this room is anticipating hearing from two of the great speakers and great articulators of yeah. Americanness that we have. And I think that's what I'm anticipating too. Well, Just a little bit on the reporting side. Yeah. Go ahead, go, go. Well, I was gonna double down on your point and no, then I want, of course I'm eager to hear your reporting. I was just gonna mention, you know, it's not a competition between the two of them. They play very different roles. You're right. Um, but Definitely. we do measure things in journalism. Uh, she did sell more, Michelle Obama did sell more books than former President Obama. And it's true. <laughs> Her book was shorter. First of all, Ari, his book was like that thick. People were like, I can't read that. They were like, her 
book was shorter, and it yeah. was like book for found and women bought it. It might not be apples <laughs> to apples, um, but also <laughs> you think about the division that has become so normalized. I've heard people in the last six years. Of of the Trump era and say, oh, well, the current president's numbers, well, they have to be low because we're so divided. Uh, obviously, Trump's numbers, they never really cracked 45 percent. Michelle Obama's numbers, um, of course, being part of the Obama legacy, that's something they share, which is why I only uh, sort of jest about competition. But her numbers are not only higher than his, uh, they're higher than most public figures. And so we think about her and the role she played. Uh, and Kamala Harris, as, as Hillary Clinton alluded to last yeah. night, playing an untraditional role. Um, as, as I like to say, and, and this is a throwback, don't believe the hype. Uh, when, when the <laughs> negative pundits say, oh, it's always going to be this polarized, or oh, a woman of color would only appeal to quote unquote this or that group, uh, not necessarily. Let's let the people decide. And so I yeah. think that's also a note, but, but back to you and your, your reporting as well. Well, no, she is uh, the single most popular figure in the Democratic Party. It's why people have this fever dream that someday she's going to run for president. Let me just disabuse y'all of that. She is never running for president, y'all. Stop saying that. Stop putting her in polls and saying she's going to. No, she's not. Uh, I, no, I'm going to. I'm going to leave aside the things that you know that I've been talking about because they're they're off this topic. So I want to bring in Alex Wagner because she is where she needs to be. She is literally right on the floor here at the DNC. We want to know what you're hearing, seeing, what's going on, uh, my friend. Uh, it's a challenging sound environment, <laughs> but as your chief vibes correspondent, I'm here to tell you that the vibrations yes. are very positive tonight. Maybe even more anticipatorily positive than they were last night, which was, you know, as you know well, Joy, an enormously uh, positive event for Joe Biden. I think that there's a lot of excitement for, you know, two of the great figures in the Democratic Party. Not just because I think people are eager to see some of the Obama era magic grafted onto the Harris Walls campaign, but I think for a Democratic Party that in the Trump years sort of wondered whether Barack Obama was an aberration, whether he was an historic anomaly, the mere presence of Barack Obama at this convention handing the reins off to Kamala Harris is a suggestion that the aberration was Donald Trump. And that America, as Barack Obama liked to invoke, is uh, the universe is is the moral arc of the universe is long, but is bending towards a sort of justice, a more inclusive society. That Barack Obama and Kamala Harris are the true sort of political future for America, and that Donald Trump was merely one step backwards before the inev inevitable pendulum swing forward. So I think there's this sense of not just excitement for the immediate future of the Democratic Party, but about the long-term prospects of American society. And that's really, I mean, uh, a, a terribly uh, intoxicating one-two punch for, for people in the audience tonight. There's just an enormous amount of excitement on the floor. And yeah, I was talking to one of the delegates from Florida who was saying, you know what? Anything can happen. This is the state of Florida where Republican, you know, registrants outnumber Democrats by a million. And look, if Florida's feeling optimistic, wow, that's all I got to say. <laughs> I know, as, so, as a former Floridian, as we always uh, take Florida optimism with a huge uh, grain of salt and a giant orange. But we'll see what happens. And I, there's a reason to be optimistic. There's a lot there. I do want to follow up a little bit on your point, um, Alice, and ask you to say more. Because earlier, uh, Nicole Wallace, our, our wonderful friend Nicole Wallace, was talking about the ways in which the Harris Walls ticket has kind of shoved Donald Trump off of the stage. And I think about the Obamas in that same way, right? And, you know, Barack Obama is the guy who em embarrassed Donald Trump at a White House correspondence dinner, so much so that Donald Trump vowed to become president. And his presidency is seen in so many ways as, you know, rejectionism against Obama, the anger and rage that this man had been a black president for two terms produced Donald Trump's presidency. You know, what are you hearing and what are people saying about the the idea that maybe Kamala Harris has sort of ended the, the Trump era, right? I mean, because there there is that sort of sense that this era was a hot fire that can't continue to burn forever and that maybe the antidote is to it is Kamala Harris, Barack Obama, Hillary Clinton, this gargantuan teamwork of the Democratic Party. Well, I mean, I've heard some, can, you know, people are, are very um, articulate in their enthusiasm, but they always end it with, you know, we have work ahead. It's going to be a tight election. People understand that this, you know, Kamala Harris hasn't run away with this by a long shot, right? So nobody's ready to write the epigraph for the Trump years. But I do think, you know, it's a, it's a powerful suggestion, right? 
that Barack Obama is the future, that Kamala Harris is the future, and that Donald Trump is the past. And indeed, that demographic reality lies at the core of so much of, of Donald Trump's power over his audience, right? The idea that a multicultural, inclusive America is actually the, the road we're heading down, and that the sort of white patriarchal society that allowed Donald Trump to profiteer as much as he has is is going into the rear view, right? That's, that's a powerful, uh, distressing idea if you are part of the white patriarchy like Donald Trump. And, and his supporters who see change, who see people like Barack Obama, who see people like Kamala Harris, you know, multi-ethnic, multiracial, progressive leaders, and are scared of that vision, right? The idea that this might be the norm and that Trumpism and MAGAism are the things of yesterday rearing their heads for one last gasp, man, that's powerful stuff. And I think, you know, yeah. one of the great things about the way Kamala Harris and Barack Obama have handled this is they don't, they don't, they don't sort of allude to that reality with fear or with triumphalism, but they say we can all be part of the future no matter what the color of our skin is. And I think indeed tonight it's going to be that classic Obama. Yeah, and I'm not sure that he's going to say there is no red America, there is no blue America, there's only the United States of America. But I think that idea that we're all in it together, that, that ism, is going to be something we hear about because Kamala Harris is a direct manifestation of that. And their friendship was forged over that reality. As Republicans continue trying to further restrict reproductive rights in the two years since the Dobbs decision, Democrats are making abortion and related health care a major campaign issue. Certainly Kamala Harris as vice president led the way on that. On the convention stage last night, we heard heart-wrenching stories from two women and a married couple about the restrictions in red states like theirs, including a young woman from Kentucky, Hadley Duvall. I was raped by my stepfather after years of sexual abuse. I can't imagine not having a choice. But today, that's the reality for many women and girls across the country because of Donald Trump's abortion bans. He calls it a beautiful thing. What is so beautiful about a child having to carry her parents' child? And joining me now is Kentucky Governor Andy Bashir, who praised Hadley for her bravery at the convention last night to be so public about her experience. The governor was on the short list as a potential Harris VP, so you went through all of that. <laughs> so why do you think abortion... Uh, is and should be such a big issue for Democrats? Well, it's a, it's a big issue because this is a constitutional right that was ripped away from my mom, my wife, my daughter, and every other woman in America. It removes the right for women to make choices about their own body, about whether to pursue IVF, uh, which is now under attack. They're even being attacked on choices about whether to have children at all. And then you see someone like Hadley Duvall, uh, an amazing person, one of the bravest people, certainly, that I have ever met. And when she shares her story, you understand. You can see the, the actual real impact that this has on people. And for her to have gone through what she went through, to have had no options if it were today, is just simply wrong. And I think everybody can agree with that. You know, and the other two women were from uh, Texas and Louisiana and had had non-viable pregnancies in some cases and uh, had no options. Um, J.D. Vance, I don't know if you know this, is blasting what you said this morning on Morning Show. Okay. okay? I'm going to just prepare you for this. Um, saying that when, when, well, let me take a look at what he said about you. J.D. Vance calls pregnancy resulting from rape inconvenient. Like, inconvenience wow. is traffic. I mean, it is, uh, it make him go through this. So what he's saying is that you were somehow suggesting, um, he said, what the hell is this? Why is Andy Bashir? he tweeted this out, uh, wishing that a member of my family would get raped. What oh. a disgusting person. So how do you respond to that? I mean, well, it's, is that what you were talking about? Of course not. It's ridiculous, but it's also deflection. I mean, J.D. Vance knows that he and Donald Trump are so wrong on this issue. And so he's trying to make himself the victim. Listen, Hadley Duvall 
was a victim. The the women that were on the stage last night, the couple that had to go through a non-viable pregnancy are, are victims. You know, as a man, J.D. Vance will never have to face any of this personally, but it's sad that he lacks the empathy to be able to put himself in a different position and to understand why having uh, exceptions, having reproductive freedom is so important in the first place. Obviously, I'd never wish harm on anyone. And it just, again, deflection, trying to make himself and Donald Trump the victims. And also get your reaction to uh, former President Trump and Lindsey Graham, for that matter, both saying that abortion should not be a major issue this campaign. Well, tell that again to those women and that couple that were on the stage last night. Uh, their pain, what they've had to, to, to go through. Uh, and, and you look at, at the fact that in so many states, it is now uh, so incredibly difficult. And, and the people of America uh, are, are responding. I mean, everywhere where this has been on the ballot, we put it on the ballot in my election last year in a state that Donald Trump won by what, about 26 points. And I won re-election by five percentage points. It tells you that the American people are fed up at this extremism. Uh, they want uh, a better tomorrow. And we're going to elect Kamala Harris and Tim Walls to get that better tomorrow. Now, I want to turn to the economy, which is the issue that most Americans say is the most important to them. Uh, Kamala Harris is doing somewhat better in some of the swing state polls than Joe Biden had and some of the national polls, which are less important as a barometer of what's going to really happen on Election Day with the Electoral College being all that counts. But on the economy as an issue, she's inching up only about two points better than Joe Biden had been in nine point lead still for Donald Trump on the economy. Uh, why can't Democrats kind of crack that? Well, we need to make sure that we're out there talking about what both Joe Biden and Kamala Harris have done uh, for the economy. Joe Biden's plan is about a long-term healthy economy. We're reshoring so much of our supply chain so we never go through what we did in the pandemic ever again. We're investing in future industries like electric vehicles and, uh, and chips. Kamala Harris's plan is about the right now. It's about being able to afford your first home, both in expanding supply and the affordability. It's about middle class tax credits that are going to help uh, so many families out there. It's about capping prescription drug costs, which we all know can be so challenging. But but it's it's about talking about it. It's about showing it. It's about showing up to places that wouldn't have been built without your policies. And I think they're going to do that. And, you know, finally, you just we're talking about the numbers. I mean, you survived a reelection in a red state where Trump had such a big lead and you still won by five points. What is your message to other Democrats who really need to do that? That's what they need to do in Pennsylvania, Western Pennsylvania, as well as a lot of red states. Well, my message is we've got to run and govern where people wake up in the morning. And they're not thinking about the polls. They're not really even thinking about this election. They're thinking about their job, whether they make enough to support their family. They're thinking about their next doctor's appointment, the roads and bridges they're going to drive, the public school that their kids go to, and their public safety. Those are places, especially with the extremism that Donald Trump has embraced where we can move the needle. And when we do that, when we improve people's lives, we don't move a state or the country to the right or the left. We just move it forward. And that's what people want, a better life. Thank you so much, Governor Andy Bashir from the great state of Kentucky. Thanks for having me. In just a couple of hours, former President Barack Obama will address the Democratic National Convention 20 years after he made his national debut at the 2004 DNC. If there is a child on the south side of Chicago who can't read, that matters to me even if it's not my child. If there's a senior citizen somewhere who can't pay for their prescription drugs and having to choose between medicine and the rent, that makes my life poorer even if it's not my grandparent. If there's an Arab American family being rounded up without benefit of an attorney or due process, that threatens my civil liberties. That is a, a walk down memory lane yes, there, is. a much younger President Obama. Joining us now, Terry Zuplatt, who served as an Obama speechwriter from 2009 to 2017, and he is the author of the upcoming book, Say It Well. Terry, we're so grateful to have you with us with what you know of the Obamas and your role as a speechwriter. As we mentioned, you worked with former President Obama for years, writing nearly 500 of his speeches. 
What do you expect to be the main themes for tonight's speech? Right, I think what you'll see is what we've been seeing from Barack Obama for 30, uh, for 20 years now. You know, it was, as you said, 20 years ago at the Democratic Convention in Boston, where a speech propelled him to ultimately national office. And when you look at that speech and you look at it against the farewell address that he gave, for instance, the themes are remarkably similar because this is a leader who has been consistent in his values and his vision and his voice for the country. And so, you know, I think he's going to celebrate the achievements of uh, his vice president, then President Biden. He's going to give a, a full-throated endorsement of Kamala Harris as a continuation of that legacy. And it'll be ultimately a vision of, you know, the America that, that he spoke to all the way back in 2004, uh, a country that welcomes all people, no matter where you come from, how, what you believe, how you pray, that this is a country that welcomes all people. And, and Kamala Harris embodies that as well. Some of the, you know, the best candidates, they embody their message, and she does that. You know, Terry, you have such a unique and wonderful skill. I mean, a, a good speech sometimes makes history. It certainly can change history. And I'm thinking when you look back at, you know, Churchill, we will fight them on the beaches. We will fight them in the hills or FDR. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself or JFK's ask not what you can what your country can do for you. And that was a Sorensen line. Where does where does the skill of the writer match with the skill of the order? Sure. Well, I think, you know, I think one of the biggest common misperceptions about speech writing and political rhetoric in this country is, you know, people often say, well, what is it like when the president says your words? Well, that's actually not how it works. And when it works correctly, the speech writer is channeling uh, the speaker, channeling the president. So your job is to give a script, to give the speaker the speech that they would give if they only had time to do it themselves. I mean, that's that's sort of a, you know, we had a team of, of six, half a dozen incredible speech writers for President Obama. There are speech writers here at the convention working with every speaker to make sure that they, you know, are consistent and stay on message. But the best speech writers are ones that, that help the speaker channel their own voice. And, you know, uh, Barack Obama famously said that he's a better speech writer than his speech writers. And, you know, as, as a speech writer, it's hard to hear, but it was true. And I asked him once, you know, what speeches are you most proud of? And one of the ones he mentioned was that 2004 speech where he said, you know, it's when you sort of bring your heart and your head together uh, and all the preparation pays off and you're in the moment. And so I think that's those are the speeches that are going to be standing out this week when a, when a speaker does that. What goes into creating an I iconic moment or the most memorable lines from speeches? How, and how much are you focusing on a line that might stand the test of time versus an overarching feeling that a speech can evoke? Right. Well, this is actually something, you know, if if President Obama ever felt that we as speechwriters were getting a little bit too caught up in trying to find the perfect line, you know, it's the dream of every speechwriter and every speaker to, to, to come up with a line that's going to be, you know, etched in memorials and, and written in the history books. But one of the things that Barack Obama was always telling us was, you know, uh, get the story right that you want to tell, get your narrative right, and the lines will follow. And I think that's true uh, when you look back at some of his greatest speeches, the great speeches throughout history that you mentioned. The speaker knew who they were, what they believed, what they wanted to convey uh, to their audience. Get the big story right. And then, you know, beautiful lines will follow. So, you know, as, as much as we love to have applause lines that get the audience on their feet, I think the speeches that stand out, the ones that really resonate are ones where the speaker tells a powerful story, again, about who they are, what they believe, their vision for the future. And how, how important is it that the speaker is a great orator? I mean, you know, for example, Churchill sure. wasn't a great orator, right? He worked on it and he really did, but he had an unusual voice and, and certainly his cadence was different. But how important is that? And then how do you think that helps the speech to become more digestible to people sure well uh, the delivery is huge delivery is very important you can have a, a beautifully written speech but if the speaker can't deliver it it's just not going to land the same way I've, I've been doing this for 30 years i've blessed to work with someone like barack obama i've also worked with some folks who you know uh didn't always deliver the speech the way i heard it the way i heard it in my head uh but i think the delivery is important because you know it's whether that speaker uh, has just a sense of the crowd. You know, if they're starting to cheer, if they're starting to applaud, you can you can ride that applause and create an, um, an experience. Uh, one of the things that, that President Obama talked to me about uh, that I include in, in the book you mentioned 
is is the creating an experience with the audience. I think the best speakers, the best uh, leaders are ones where they forge this deep emotional connection in the moment. You know, I was here last night. You, there are moments when you can feel it. Um, but we all know that there are moments when, you know, you, we've all heard speeches and you don't feel it. So I think creating this experience that, that someone can take with them and the kind of feeling, the hope, the energy that then lets them, you know, go out there and knock on doors and campaign and work hard and make phone calls and donate. That's what wins campaigns. And so that's the energy and the experience that a great speaker creates. And that's, that's the whole purpose of this convention, right, is to energize a party and send them out and do the work for the next 70 or so days. Just quickly, if you will, I'm curious. I'm sure you've studied speeches as part of the work you do. Do you have a favorite, a favorite speech in history that stands out? <laughs> Sure. You know, I do. And this is one that that a lot of speechwriters uh, often talk about. Uh, Robert Kennedy gave a speech in South Africa. Uh, it's famously called the, the Ripples of Hope speech, where he talked about how how the smallest of actions can can create ripples that create kind of a tidal wave that can tear down the, the greatest walls of, of oppression and injustice. And, you know, it's a beautiful speech. It's a speech about young people changing the world. And, and it you know, it's decades old, but you can read it now and it can still speak to you today. Uh, that, that's one of my favorite. I have a lot of favorite, yeah. but that's one of my favorite. And like you said, that message that kind of endures through the test of time. Terry Zuplat, thank you for, for sharing so much with us this morning. Uh, let me bring into our conversation one of our favorites, NBC News political correspondent Jacob Soberoff, back on the floor of the convention. I have to ask you, did you get in trouble for messing with that telephone? Not yet, but I've been requesting access to the boiler room, Nicole, and it has not yet been approved by the Democratic National Committee. So maybe, maybe. I'm not sure. All right. Well, keep uh, me out of it. I this is I, I'm going to I'm going to disown you if you know if they ask you who you were on you're the in New with. York. You got nothing to worry about, Nicole. <laughs> All right. What do, what do you got today? Um, I, let me start here, but I was listening to your conversation with Dan, and I want to get into election interference. And actually, I want to oh, take a walk over to Georgia in a second, just based on the conversation that you were having. But uh, I don't know what this is about, but this wasn't here yesterday. This is at the beginning of the California delegation, and there's a lot of reserve, reserve seats. You guys know what's up with the reserve seats in the delegation? Okay, so the big shots in California have now got reserve seats here. Hmm. Um, I don't know who's coming. I think it, I saw Governor Newsom show up at the end of last night. But this is a place to keep an eye. Hi, how are you guys? A place to keep, let's say, you want to say hello real quick? Say hi to Nicole Wallace. We're live on MSN. Hi, Nicole Wallace. How are you? How are hi, you? Nicole. We're from Philly. They're from hi. Philly. I she love She says, Philly. how are you? You guys doing all right? We're doing great. She's a big fan of Philly. Okay, oh. nice to see you guys. Have fun. Okay, Nicole, let's go back to Georgia because that conversation was so interesting. And sorry to do this while I'm walking, but... Um, you know, we, I was just reading Lisa Rubin's article on MSNBC.com about uh, what's going on with this Georgia State Election Board and these three commissioners that uh, former President Trump has been uh, praising as pit bulls um, for the actions they're taking, uh, allowing them to potentially slow uh, the count of the votes and review the votes. Mm -hmm. I want to talk to people back here if they are actually concerned um, about what they think uh, might, excuse me, might ultimately be the outcome of the election in Georgia, given how narrow that margin was uh, in 2020. So it looks like there's a couple of folks here uh, from Georgia right now. And let me just see if I can. Uh, if I can and Jacob, it. ask them if they, if they yeah, know that their Republican lieutenant governor is speaking there tonight. OK, I will. Ah, that's a great point. Thank you. Are you guys Georgia delegates? Yes, yes we are. are. Do you know that your Republican lieutenant governor is speaking here tonight? Yes, yes. Oh, yeah. You, yeah. Or, you really? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Did you? Come on over. Sir, Jacob Soberoff. We're live on MSNBC. What's your name? <laughs> Al Williams from Midway, Georgia. So, What are your thoughts on, on your lieutenant governor being up on the stage? Great guy. I served with him. We were on the different sides of several issues. He was in the majority. I was in the minority. But Jeff was always a stand-up guy. And... I've been really impressed with his courage. I think a lot about it. Let's talk about what's going on with your uh, state election board, because there's a lot of concern. That's former, a whole new story. A whole new story. Yeah. Former President Trump, you know, has praised these commissioners as pit bulls. They made some changes that uh, a lot of folks think, in particular the Harris campaign, we were just talking with them here on MSNBC, Nicole Wallace was, uh, that could affect the outcome of the election. Are you guys concerned about potential election interference in Georgia, given how close the margin? We are. The patients have taken over the asylum. Mm. Taken over the asylum. Yeah, sir. Yeah. It's crazy. What can be done uh, in Georgia to fight back against this? How are you all? I mean, you all have your one vote, but but 
what is what is to be done in Georgia given the actions that have been taken by the board? Well, um, you know, I work in the civic engagement space, and, and there are organizations that are currently filing lawsuits right now to take this stuff out because this is, you know, the, what the state election board's passing is ridiculous. And we're trying to stop this because we know that Georgia is going to help deliver uh, for Vice President Harris. And we know for a fact that they're going to try as hard as they can to prevent Vice President Harris from getting in. But we know we're going to do the work on the ground to get folks out to vote for. I, I appreciate that, you guys. Thank you very much for talking to me. Oh, oh, it's, yeah. it's really nice to meet oh, you. I have one more question. I Oh, Nicole's got another question. question for you. Go ahead, Nicole. You know, Shea Moss and Ruby Freeman became the face of the election workers, the, the sort of yes, pure public servants who were abused by Trump's lies and his conduct. What is Georgia doing to protect their election workers this time? There, Shea Moss and Ruby Freeman are names now, I think, across the country, everybody knows, for what Donald Trump did to them uh, in the wake of the 2020 election. And, and there is no bigger fan than election uh, poll workers than me. I spent a lot of time in those polling places uh, on election night. What is being done in the state to protect these workers who not only, many of them volunteer their time and energy to uphold basically uh, our greatest civic responsibility, which is going to the polls? Unfortunately, it's where you live as to mm. what's being done. In some areas, everybody is happy. In areas that's looking for fairness, you certainly protect your own. And the best thing that can be done is we vote the Republicans out of the majority, vote us in, and change the board back to a realistic board. And you, do you think that that's in the realm of possibility? Absolutely. Democrats will become the majority in Georgia. It is simply a matter of time. We need to get there, get out there, organize, mobilize, ensure people are registering to vote. Because all of this is to prevent people, strip people from the voter rolls, keep them from being actually registered voters. Because Republicans in Georgia know that the fewer people go out to vote, they win. We need to get people out to vote so Democrats can win because Georgia is and will be a blue state. Simply a matter of time. Yeah, I heard Stacey Abrams, of course, talk a lot about that. I mean, the power of the vote, the of the vote. is the way to fight back That's against the, the, the encroachment back. on the vote. Yeah. Well, you guys, thank you very much. Really thank nice you. to talk to you. Thank Didn't plan this, Nicole. I heard your earlier <laughs> conversation. I thought it might be interesting <laughs> to go over there and, and chat with folks in Georgia about what's going on. And. Uh, you know, I, this is not the only state, obviously, that this is happening in, as you guys were just talking about. Yeah. And I think, you know, that's sort of one of the uh, sub conversations happening here on the floor. There's a lot of excitement, a lot of enthusiasm with President Obama, uh, Michelle Obama coming out tonight. Um, but but there's, this is uh, deadly serious, as we all know. Uh, democracy is on the line. Uh, and you got the rank and file um, working on it day in and day out, as you just heard. You know, Jacob, I wonder how much January 6th is something that's going to come up um, this week. I, I know Sergeant Gunnell is one of the speakers. Um, he's been on my show. He was one of the witnesses, um, one of the law enforcement officials who was engaged in uh, medieval combat, I think is what he described it, with Trump supporters. Yeah. How much does that come up in your conversations or, or, or in the speeches in the room? No, I, I think in the, to use the same words that were uh, used by Judge Dana Sabra in the Southern District of California when he overturned Trump's family separation policy, it shocked the conscience of mm -hmm. a lot of people that are here at the convention. And I think that there's a, a deep concern about uh, ultimately if and when uh, Vice President Harris and Governor Wall, uh, Walls ultimately do win the election, uh, if Donald Trump uh, will concede that election. And, uh, you know, just listening to him, I think that there's there continues to be a lot of concern amongst people on the floor here uh, as to whether or not we'll see a repeat of what happened uh, on, on January 6th. But obviously, there's no there is no way uh, to predict that. Um, but but it, people continue to talk about it. And, and as you said, I think that the campaign is well aware of that. And that's what we're going to hear from uh, folks who had firsthand experience uh, up on that stage. And uh, let me turn you around so you can just uh, get a look. Um, up on that stage uh, over the course of the next three nights. Jacob, one of the things that shocked my uh, conscience was your reporting from the floor of the Republican convention. And I think one of the convention goers handed you the mass deportation placard that um, yeah. she didn't make with a marker at home. It was made for her and handed out and they were waving it around. And one of the images circulating widely on social media this week is the Republicans waving mass deportation signs while um, Democratic uh, convention goers are waving things like if we fight, we win and Kamala, Kamala yes. or Jill, Jill for Jill Biden. Um, and just, uh, unions, union signs and support of unions. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, j just 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 jump up on that. What What is the sort of um, the, the difference in terms of what you feel like each party stands for in this moment and is willing to sort of um, hold above its head in terms of a bumper sticker? 
I, I said it um, about a month ago at the Republican convention, and I'll say it again now, it was deeply disturbing, and I don't know any other way to describe it, to be on the floor of a convention where literally thousands of people are holding up a sign that says mass deportation now, when the stated goal of the Republican Party in the platform of the Republican Party and of the Donald Trump campaign is to conduct the largest deportation ever in American history, modeled after Dwight D. Eisenhower's 1954 operation that deported over a million Mexicans and some Mexican Americans uh, to Mexico, uh, in a, with a name, by the way, that is so racist and so offensive, I will not repeat it uh, on television. Remember. This is a, and by the way, if it might shock you and shock your conscience, this comes from the people uh, who ran the family separation policy yeah. under uh, former President uh, Donald Trump, where 5,500 people were deliberately taken uh, apart from their parents uh, only for the purpose of scaring away other people from coming into this country. And as Adam Serwer said, the cruelty was the point uh, in the Atlantic. That is obviously not what you are seeing uh, at the convention here. In fact, uh, the immigration was brought up last night by, by President Biden, but we didn't even actually hear a lot about uh, immigration. And I am interested to see the context in which it is brought up over the course uh, of the next couple of nights, because President Biden has protected 500,000 um, family members of undocumented immigrants just in the last couple of months with executive uh, actions. He's certainly been criticized on the immigration front for more restrictive policies. Um, but on the other hand, he is he is putting forward these uh, these policies that you haven't seen the likes of which since uh, DACA. And so when it comes to the signs, I think that there is no comparison, Nicole, and, and that meme is a very accurate uh, portrayal of what's going on around here.